Akbar, what do you think? Should we start or should we wait? Okay, awesome. So, Gene, welcome. Uh, we are so delighted to have you. Um, I, I think, you know, when I come across like a really interesting paper in the space of applied ML and people actually trying to implement models and study how well they work in real life, um, your paper really st uh, stuck out and like it, it, it was a published in May of 2022. So immediately when that paper came out, I think I emailed a bunch of people here and I was like, we have to invite Gene to come uh, and talk to us uh, about some of the work that you're doing. So uh, Gene is uh, an assistant professor uh, in epidemiology and biostats at UCSF, part of the UCSF UC Berkeley joint program uh, in computational precision health. Um, Gene's work focuses on reliability um, in uh, machine learning, interpretability, particularly involving black box models. Um, she got a uh, fairly large grant from PCORI uh, in November focused on studying and developing diagnostic tools for kind of interrogating machine learning models, making sure they're working as expected, which we'd love to hear more about. Um, and you know, last year she had this wonderful paper called Clinical AI uh, Quality Improvement Towards Continual Monitoring and Updating of AI Algorithms in Healthcare. And a lot of folks in our community here across the med school, across college of engineering, statistics, public health, other departments have been thinking about this problem in different ways and you know, dealing with it as we're implementing stuff and trying to figure out uh, how well it's doing in practice. So we are so delighted to have you here and to, to talk to you about this. So uh, my champ, one of the you know harms of presenting to my champ is constantly being interrupted with questions. So just I'm just throwing that harm out there as something to be aware of. This is a very engaging group. So this is not something where you're going to kind of present to like 40 minutes of silence and then get questions. There may be some questions in between. So if you have questions, I would encourage you to uh, put them in chat. I you know if there's a question that we need to address right away, I will kind of read it off to you, Gene. So uh, thanks everyone in attendance, and we're again really excited to have you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm excited to talk to everyone. Um, yeah, so this talk is somewhat based off of that paper, but also kind of a bit more recent work as well. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to talk about QA and QI for machine learning based clinical decision support systems. Okay, uh, I'm probably preaching to the choir with this page then, but uh, as, as many of you know, machine learning models can deteriorate over time, and that's why we want to actually have these QI, QA and QI frameworks for um, checking that our models are doing what they claim to be doing. Um, here's just an example. Um, this is a, I think, 2020 paper. I'm forgetting which is that year. Uh, but they were showing how uh, a machine learning model predicting emergency department admissions during COVID-19, um, or <laughs> emergency department admissions, and it was getting an AUC of 0 0.85 prior to the pandemic, and then within a, a few months of the start of the pandemic, that AUC starts tanking with no end in sight. Um, here's a second example where this is a, this is a gradual form of performance decay, whereas the first one was a bit more sudden. Um, and this is an example where they had various machine learning models ranging from logistic regression to tree-based models to neural networks uh, for predicting risk of acute kidney injury. Um, and then over the course of eight years, you can see that the estimated calibration index, so this is a measure of miscalibration of a machine learning model, um, this gradually increases over time. Some models decay faster than others, but all of them are trending worse over time. Okay, so machine learning models can decay over time. We do need to have some sort of monitoring framework in place and maybe even updating these models. Um, and you don't have to just take my word for it. Uh, the FDA, Health Canada, European Medi Medicines Agency, the EMA, have also put out uh, 10 tenants of good machine learning practice. Uh, and the last of the 10, but hopefully last but not least, um, is that deployed models should be monitored for performance. Um, and also, if we're going to retrain those models, we need to pay particular scrutiny to the retrained models because uh, the retraining procedure itself can make performance worse. 
or there's a risk of that at least. Um, but what's really missing in this document is that it doesn't really detail what statistical methods need to be actually used um, to rigorously monitor performance or update these models. Um, I don't think regulatory agencies have provided any such document really. Um, and while the medical kind of community has called for um, the need for monitoring and updating these machine learning models, I don't think there are actually concrete guidelines of how to do so. Um, I see some questions in the chat already. Let's see. Were these models in production? Ah, right. Um, the example models I had shown were actually retrospective analyses. I don't think they were deployed in production. Um, yeah, I think one of the conversations that I know uh, I'll be having with Sir are separately, but also I think is relevant and something we've been thinking about is once a model is deployed and you have a workflow linked to it and such that it your outcome actually changes because of your workflow, any retraining, you know, maybe predicting a different thing. And then, yes. you know, uh, so feel free to kind of come back to that concept, but I think that's- uh, that That might actually be one of the big focuses of this talk. So uh, <laughs> uh, I don't think we have an answer to the entire problem, but we've taken a first step. Um, right, so there aren't actually really good guidelines for how to do this. Um, and I think part of the reason is that there is literature on this, maybe relatively small compared to the rest of the machine learning literature, um, but the existing methods don't actually have very rigorous guarantees. Um, and that makes it difficult to deploy in the healthcare setting, um, given that our stakes are pretty high. Uh, so the approach that our group has been taking is to appeal to the connection between like performance monitoring with quality assurance or QA, and then model retraining with quality improvement. Um, and by establishing this connection with QE and QI, which is a, like the QE and QI field has been around for a very long time, um, even before machine learning uh, became a thing. Um, and QE and QI are used extensively. Um, they, the methods were first pioneered by, uh, uh, statistical giants like William Deeming and lots of statisticians and biostatisticians have also contributed to this toolbox, as well as outside of statistics. I think QA and QI have, I think lots of people have contributed kind of either like just frameworks for how to brainstorm how, like what the potential causes are for performance decay um, to like very mathematical type of tools. There are all sorts of tools in this QA and QI toolbox, um, and it's used across various domains, including industrial manufacturing. Uh, Toyota is very, very famous for this. Um, hospitals have also kind of adopted some of these methods. Uh, so many departments have QA and QI units. Um, so the CDC also uses some of these tools for surveillance um, in the population. Um, and by really appealing to QA and QI, the hope is that uh, given that these tools are already in production, uh, hopefully we can provide in machine learning similarly practical tools. Okay, so this was kind of the paper that Karen Deep had mentioned um, that we published that was hope that was hoping to be like a first step to providing some more concrete tools for using in machine learning. Um, and on the QA side, uh, there are certainly many methods that you could start applying now. Um, some of them are, have uh, particular restrictions. You can't apply it to every setting, but generally the tools that exist on the QA side for monitoring performance include stuff like the QSUM, Yuma, sequential change point detection. Um, these methods provide a statistical test as well as a visualization of performance over time. And so the chart looks something like this usually. Uh, the blue line here is a chart statistic. It indicates a uh, deviation from the null hypothesis of there being no performance decay. And then the orange line here is a control limit. Um, this basically says if the chart statistic exceeds that level, 
um, we have pretty strong evidence that uh, the model performance is very poor and we're gonna fire an alarm and have the hospital kind of investigate into what is going on underneath the hood. On the quality improvement side, uh, there's less like, there are fewer, traditional tools in QI that we can actually draw from. Um, but there are some methods that we thought at least had reasonable guarantees. Uh, so there are just like one time updating methods and online hypothesis testing if you had slightly more frequent updates. So these methods, these first two kind of work well in kind of more stationary settings um, where things are pretty constant and you're just hoping to get performance improvement really. Um, this last one, online model, updating or online model recalibration or revision, uh, these methods are a bit more targeted toward settings where uh, the hospital is like changing over time. There's a lot of dynamic kind of time trends. Um, and the hope is that these methods can kind of catch up with that. Uh, these methods have somewhat strong guarantees, though, of course, we I think it would be nice if they were stronger. Uh, so there are some limitations with both of these kind of existing methods, like some of them can be used immediately, but they do have some limitations. So on the QA side, um, these methods were originally really developed for industrial manufacturing. Um, and you can imagine like monitoring, I don't know, computers off of a factory line is very different from monitoring patients uh, who come to the hospital. Um, so for instance, these methods assume you always have gold standard labels. That's not always the case. Uh, these methods assume you have representative sampling. Um, and really, we, it, if you wanted to directly apply it, uh, I think the most obvious way is to assume the machine learning algorithm is locked. Uh, and that's kind of the perspective we took in our paper. When we talked about QA, it was really for locked machine learning algorithms. Uh, and then on the quality improvement side, kind of what I mentioned, uh, the methods for online model updating uh, don't have very strong guarantees or sometimes have no guarantees whatsoever um, if there are kind of shifts over time. Uh, another limitation that you, I mean, there's plenty of them, but like another thing to think about is that these methods typically only give you performance guarantees with respect to one performance measure, but we often want to track multiple over time. So Jean? This particular limitation that weak or no performance guarantees for non stationary yeah. settings, it seems like that's like critical. Like, yeah, if you're implementing a model and you've got a workflow linked to it where the workflow is actually quite effective at reducing whatever it is that you're trying to predict, it almost seems like the more effective your treatment, the like less you'd want to ever touch your model. Yes. Uh, <laughs> this only works if your treatment is ineffective. It's kind of, <laughs> but your patient population. Yeah, yeah. And I don't, I think there have been papers that have highlighted how if you're, the more effective your treatment is, uh, the worse your retraining will be. Yeah. Um, the feedback loop problem. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if there are papers that kind of followed up on that, on what to do. I think there was some, there was like one theoretical paper that said like, you'll, you'll reach some sort of convergence with some stability, but that's like, that was a very theoretical paper. So I don't know. I definitely think it's worth exploring. Um, and I'm maybe, maybe our, our group will kind of push in that direction next. We haven't decided what exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, I have another question in the chat. Uh, could you elaborate on what you mean when you talk about strong guarantees? If you mean probability detecting process being out of control, what assumptions would you be relying on? Uh, if we're talking about on the quality improvement side in terms of like model updating, um, these guarantees are not very, well, I'll, I'll kind of get to it, but basically like the performance guarantees that they provide usually are along the lines of over a very long time period, the average performance of my continually learning model will be no worse or will not be significantly worse than some reference model. Um, but that's comparing an average, and that's also comparing over an average of over a very long time period. 
And that might not be very useful if, for instance, there might be sudden performance decay. Um, and then on the monitoring side, in terms of performance guarantees, those are usually in, in the form of like type one, type two errors, uh, just like ordinary hypothesis testing. Um, okay, hopefully I've addressed the questions. I have uh, one question that was just like going to be harder to, to type out. So I, I'm curious uh, in, in terms of thinking about the, the variety of quality assurance, like sort of like run charts and process control charts. Yeah. You know, I've never, I've never really heard of anybody referring to them as gold standard labels being needed. I mean, as in terms of like exploratory tools that sort of like kind of run contrary to that. And representative sampling isn't quite the same as like you know, if you're trying to improve a factory line, like you can't get a representative, yeah. like, so that's not the right sampling frame. And then I don't know about like locking because like you can change your reference lines through any of these process control charts. So I, I guess I kind of feel like those limitations aren't exactly fair to like an entire sort of representation of sure, a process sure. control chart. So I'm just like, that's fair. I'm a little bit on my heels looking at that going like, actually, I don't think any of those are right. So I'm, I'm a little trying to figure out like what, yeah, what, how um, far am I supposed maybe to go along? Maybe the example I'll give you will illustrate why I've highlighted those problems. Um, okay. But I agree. Like, I, I guess like people don't typically think about gold standard labels in terms of process control. You're just monitoring some sort of label. Um, but the example I will give you is where the label is completely off, kind of what Karen Deep was mentioning. Like, if I treat my patients, like, I can't use those labels. Um, okay, was there any other questions? Okay. Um, right, so there are, yeah, so there are tools, but there's still room for improvement. And the two specific questions we've been kind of thinking about is one, uh, on the QA side, how do we monitor the performance of machine learning algorithms in the presence of confounding medical interventions? Um, and on the QI side, uh, can we design some sort of online logistic recalibration procedure with stronger performance guarantees than what kind of exists in the literature? Okay, so with that, I'm going to start with the first question that we asked on the QA side. Um, and this is joint work with these fine folks. Um, Alexei Berkman, Nick, and Jean, these, uh, they're from the FDA, um, from CDRH, and kind of the researchy group uh, there. And then Romain is a clinician as well as a statistician uh, at UCSF. Okay, so what are confounding medical interventions? Um, so I'm gonna kind of define this through an example because it's probably most easily explained in this kind of setting. Uh, suppose we have a model for predicting post-operative nausea and vomiting, POMV. So this is a common side effect of anesthesia. Um, and even now clinicians already have some sort of machine learning model that helps stratify uh, patients based off of their risk. Though I th think the existing model that's commonly used is pretty simple. Uh, but you can certainly think that in the future, it will be more complex using some machine learning algorithm. Okay, so uh, this is this DAG is illustrating kind of what are what I imagine the data to be generated like. Um, XT here represents the variables for the patient who walks through the door at time T. Um, and then we have a machine learning model F hat that gives some sort of risk prediction. And so maybe our machine learning model says, hey, this patient is at high risk of POMV. So this machine learning model is outputting some sort of probability. Um, and then, so given this risk prediction, the clinician is probably more encouraged to intervene and provide additional treatment. Um, so we're gonna use AT here to represent which treatment uh, is assigned to the patient. AT equals zero means they are given standard of care, no additional treatment is given. Whereas AT equals one means we kind of intervene. We give additional anti-immediates. 
Uh, okay, so maybe our, our clinician actually administers prophylactic treatment, um, and then we observe some outcome in our patient. We'll denote that but with YT. Um, YT equals zero means they don't have POMV, and then YT equals one means they do. Um, and it's, well, good for the patient if they don't develop POMV, um, but it's problematic on the monitoring side uh, because it's really hard to tell if our, our model was right or wrong. Um, like our model predicted the patient was at high risk, but then if we don't see them developing POMV, is the model wrong or was our treatment just made, did our treatment actually just make a difference? And so this is kind of the issue known as confounding medical interventions. Okay, so we have a machine learning model that basically tries to predict what the patient's risk is under standard of care, um, but so, which means like we don't really, we can't really use the outcomes from the patients who are treated or get additional intervention. Um, so we're going to have to really use the data from patients receiving standard of care. Um, and so let's just kind of go down this line of thinking and see where this leads us. So if we were going to monitor some sort of marginal performance measure, like an expected loss, um, so L here denotes our loss function, yt of zero. So I'm starting to use potential outcomes notation from causal inference. Um, so yt of zero means what the outcome of the patient would have been if they were left untreated. And that's the kind of the target of prediction we're thinking about right now, given our machine learning model f hat. And so L, so we have an expected loss. This could be an accuracy. It could, uh, it, I guess if you make this even more fancy, it could look like an AUC. Um, and well, if we actually try to calculate this marginal performance measure among the patients receiving standard of care, uh, there's a problem because we know that the untreated patients aren't fully representative of the target population, which is everyone, uh, because our untreated patients will probably generally have uh, lower risk predictions. Uh, so the standard thing to do then is to adjust for treatment propensities, um, or at least in the offline setting. Uh, in the retrospective setting, the typical thing to do is to adjust for treatment propensities using something like inverse propensity weighting. Uh, the challenge here is that propensities are probably changing regularly over time because the clinician is repeatedly interacting with the machine learning model and the clinician can look at past performance of the model, past predictions, um, and, when, and as a re result, the clinician's trust in the machine learning model can change and how they decide to assign treatment then will also change. And if we don't have an accurate estimate of the treatment propensities, a lot of these methods, these existing methods for monitoring uh, will no longer provide valid statistical inference. Um, right. Okay, so monitoring marginal performance is pretty tricky because it's, it'll be pretty hard to get accurate estimates of treatment propensities. Um, and so our team was thinking like, is there a way for hospitals to start monitoring as soon as possible using hopefully existing tools? Um, and that got us thinking about what if we monitor a conditional performance measure instead? Um, so these are performance measures defined with respect to a condi the conditional distribution of the outcome given the model's risk prediction. Um, so this can correspond to something like model calibration um, or positive and negative predictive values. And the intuition for why we want to target something like a conditional performance measure is that it's essentially conditioning away the part that will vary a lot across populations because we know that we think the, the risk prediction will vary a lot. And by putting it on the right hand, right hand side of the conditioning bar, hopefully we kind of can avoid the whole problem of adjusting treatment propensities. Um, right, and, and conditional performance measures uh, 
will not depend on kind of the prevalence of different uh, risk predictions. Okay, so kind of the idea is let's monitor conditional performance and hopefully we can avoid this whole issue of uh, modeling treatment propensities. Gene, quick question. Yeah. So the, the last statement you made about, you know, conditional mm -hmm. uh, performance, the if there's calibration drift, that would violate, like, like calibration drift happens because presumably it's not, it, it is prone to distribution shift, or, right? Like, or, or how does calibration drift play into this kind of a measure? Yeah, so I think we're going to actually target monitoring calibration drift. Got it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so there are, so the kind of the roadmap that we had in our mind was that if we want to, if we monitor conditional performance, that's just basically a some sort of estimate of conditional distributions. And there exist tools for monitoring conditional distributions and monitoring shifts in these conditional distributions. So if there are already tools that can test the null hypothesis that there is no change in a conditional distribution, can we basically take those tools that exist for the standard setting without confounding medical interventions and really just bring that over to our setting um, and directly apply it to our data? Um, and where I mean direct, when I mean directly apply it, I mean just monitor the patients for receiving standard of care. Um, and for the statisticians of the audience, here is some math or some formalization of kind of where we're going with this. In the standard setting, you have sequentially arriving observations um, with covariate ZT and outcome YT. Uh, and the null hypothesis we're testing is the conditional distribution of Y given Z is constant over time, given some sort of parameter theta, so this is parameterizing this conditional distribution, and delta here indicates how much of a shift is happening. Uh, under the null, there is no shift, so delta equals to zero all, all the time. Um, on, under the alternative, delta is zero before some change point kappa, and then it is not zero after some change point kappa. In the CMI setting, uh, basically the math looks very similar, except that things are trickier because we have, we're only analyzing a random subsequence of the data. We're only analyzing the patients who receive standard of care. So if you had three patients who walked through the door, but AT equals one, uh, you would have to remove this when you actually directly apply these tools. Um, and then I have some index here that actually tau I, that indices, uh, that indicates which patient, um, the index of the ith patient who receives standard of care. And these are the people we're going to monitor specifically. Okay. Um, and to be able to take a tool that exists for the standard setting and really apply it over to the CMI setting, you basically need to check that all the assumptions that the standard monitoring procedure makes are satisfied. Like it assumes conditional independence, which may or may not hold. Um, it also monitors a particular quantity and mo monitors delta, but once you move it to the CMI setting, are we still kind of monitoring the right quantity? Um, so we need to establish kind of when we're allowed to ignore treatment propensities, ignore the treated patients. Um, and we've established ignorability conditions that probably look quite familiar to you if you've uh, done causal inference. Um, the first ignorability condition we considered was basically no unmeasured confounding or conditional exchangeability. It says you can take a tool that exists in this, a standard monitoring tool and apply it to CMI, ignoring everything. If the clinician's propensity to treat a patient um, only depends on their risk prediction, F hat of X, and the clinician's past experiences interacting with the machine learning algorithm. So here we're saying the clinician's trust level treatment propensities can change arbitrarily over time as long as kind of this condition holds. Um, and this holds in the example DAG kind of I'm showing right here. Um, this is obviously kind of strong of an assumption um, because surely the, the treatment propensity will depend on other variables as well. So you can extend this to include other variables.
Um, oh, I realized there's a question. Um, how do you measure clinician trust if you're conditioning on that? Right, we're not actually going to try to model clinician trust because I find that very difficult to do. So that the whole premise of this project is like, how do we avoid modeling this completely? <laughs> Hopefully that answers the question. And kind of if we establish these types of conditions or if you can kind of justify these conditions, um, then you can avoid that whole issue. Ah, um, can this approach deal with multiple ways a process can go out of control? Um, this is a bit more, I guess I haven't thought about other types of settings that much. Um, I'm really thinking about the setting of this particular type of, this type of flavor for when a, when a, when a process goes out of control, which is that, uh, so I don't think it's like outliers or, or pulse outliers. Um, this is more like a drift detection method. Um, because this is the null hypothesis is that there's no change in kind of performance over time. And then the alternative is there is a time point at which there is a performance change. And that kind of that performance change will stay pretty steady. Th this null this hypothesis test is particularly designed for detecting sudden performance decay, but it we've also found that it works fine with gradual performance decay. Okay. Um, there's another ignorability condition that I don't think I want to go through, um, but basically it considers an, a setting where we allow for unmeasured confounding. Okay. Um, and then there's actually a few more things that you have to verify outside of kind of uh, these ignorability conditions. Um, so the other additional things is that there are these monitoring procedures actually do make other types of assumptions that might not apply to CMI that we also have to verify. In particular, if the clinician's trust in the machine learning algorithm is constantly varying, uh, the types of patients who receive standard of care also are different over time, and that results in non-stationary predictors. So you just have different types of patients who are kind of coming through the door um, that are being monitored. And these existing methods really oftentimes assume that uh, essentially it assumes patients are similar over time and the types of patients who are receiving um, standard of care is stationary. Uh, and we can't actually make that assumption. So we need to double check that these the methods we are going to be applying allow for non-stationarity. Um, also, when you have a machine learning model that's being applied at various hospitals, um, the, perform the exact characteristics of the conditional performance might not be known. And usually you have to estimate that from finite data. Um, and so you also want to take into account kind of the estimation uncertainty. So when we looked in the literature, there aren't actually too many frequentist methods that exist out there. Um, there are methods that handle kind of one of these issues, but not both. So we've developed a new score-based QSUM procedure that addresses this. So, I mean, it's not super new. It takes a QSUM and kind of extends it just a bit. The idea is when you have a machine learning model that does well, the gradient of the negative log likelihood uh, or gradient of the log likelihood should be very close to zero. Um, but if a machine learning model is doing poorly, uh, that gradient should be far from zero because gradients indicate that you need to update your machine learning model. So the chart statistic is basically checking for the cumulative sum of these scores or the gradient of the log likelihood. Um, and when the cumulative sum of these gradients is very far away from zero, we're gonna fire an alarm. Um, and to also handle non-stationary, we consider dynamic control limits rather than static ones. So this is what a control chart would look like if you use a score-based QSUM method. The blue line again is a chart statistic, um, but the orange the orange line is a is the control limit that we're checking if it 
And so that's kind of our upper threshold for firing an alarm. And the key difference using this type of method is that the control limit actually does vary over time, depending on the patient characteristics. Um, whereas uh, I guess more traditional methods have a flat line. And then, so that's one type of method you could use if you're a frequentist. If you're a Bayesian, it turns out like it's both, both awesome and kind of annoying. Um, standard Bayesian methods already handle non-stationary predictor sequences. They also handle estimation uncertainty. The only problem is there's not very good off-the-shelf software for doing this because um, posterior inference over very long time periods is quite challenging. And also if you have slightly more complex models of performance decay, uh, you might have to rely on approximate posterior inference. Anyhow, um, we were, at least for our kind of empirical experiments, we were able to take STAN, the stan standard like Bayesian software, um, and apply it. Uh, it wasn't the most efficient thing, but it was actually much, much slower than the QSUM procedure, uh, but we got it to run at least. And so the chart statistic here is very nice to interpret. It's just the posterior probability of there having been a change point. And then the control limit is just whatever rate of false alarm that you want to control for. So it's one minus alpha, where alpha is the rate of false alarms. So now your control chart will look something like this. Um, there is a question. Well, how does a QSUM chart differ from a P chart? Uh, I think the P chart's a bit more for detecting kind of if you have very sudden outliers for a short period of time, whereas like, uh, QSM charts are a bit more for detecting um, a drift, like a small drift, but like uh, a consistent performance shift at, after some time point. Thanks, Gene. Yeah, I wonder if, you know, the, the P chart might actually be a way to look at what Alejandro was bringing up, like the out, pulse outliers or things. Yeah. That, when there's an update in the EHR and in case some mapping gets messed up, like it would be kind of a sudden like a sudden type of thing rather than a more gradual phenomenon. Well, I guess it's like the- but it might be too sensitive or, yeah. Well, I guess like the QSUM is a bit more de more for detecting a shift that after a time point, that shift just kind of exists or the shift was a gradual thing. Whereas I think the pulse outliers are like, they're suddenly, suddenly the model performance will do really poorly and then it goes back to normal again. Uh, I think in practice, when you have like a whole kind of framework going, I feel like you would just apply lots of different monitoring procedures. Um, but yeah. Okay, so the nice thing is I think generally these two methods are pretty robust. There, there are some things that can be improved on the Bayesian side. Um, and using these tools, we were able to kind of ask some questions that were relevant to us. Like what is the impact of clinician trust on us being able to actually monitor performance? So we simulated three different clinicians here. Um, none here means our clinician totally dislikes our machine learning model and ignores it completely. Um, calibrated means a clinician treats at the same probability of the risk prediction. Um, and then an over means that the clinician overly trusts our machine learning model. Whenever that risk is over 0 0.5, they basically always treat the patient. And whenever the risk is below 0 0.5, they basically never treat the patient. And when we first ran the simulation, we were very confused because what you see here are three lines that are totally on top of each other. So on the x-axis, um, we have alert time. So this is the and then on the y-axis, we have proportion of alarms fired up to that time point. This dashed vertical line is when a shift actually occurs. Um, and so this is basically showing power. Like you want this curve to be as close to one as possible after the change point, of course. Um, and using QSUM or Bayesian procedures, you basically see these curves are totally on top of each other, maybe even over-trusting improved power. Um, and this was a confusing figure. Um, but what we realized what was happening was that um, the reason that you can you don't see much difference is that the 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 pop the subpopulation experiencing um, performance drift in the simulation 
were we had basically simulated performance drift symmetrically in the population. So people with very high risk predictions and very low risk predictions were e getting kind of equal performance drift. And so a very overly trusting clinician um, wouldn't mask the data we're getting in the untreated patients who have very low risk, who are also getting a lot of kind of performance decay. Um, and that's kind of illustrated here. Um, uh, sampling propensity is basically whether or not uh, the probability of them being untreated. And so these are the high risk patients who experience a very large shift in their conditional risk. And then these patients have very low risk predictions and very likely to be untreated and therefore very likely to be in our monitoring data um, who also get a very large shift. And so regardless of trust level, we were basically always going to monitor, we're able to collect enough data from the low risk patients who experience a lot of performance decay. Uh, if you change the simulation and really just concentrate all of the performance decay in the very, very high risk group, that's when you see a huge difference. Um, here, if, if your clinician totally distrusts your model and basically randomly assigns treatment, um, then we have a lot of power for detecting performance decay. But if your clinician overly trusts the model and always treats the high-risk patients who are the only people getting performance decay and, or for which we simulate performance decay, then we basically have no power for detecting those types of performance, uh, this type of shift. Uh, so what's kind of the whole point of this very, very long story? Um, I think when you're designing a machine learning model kind of monitoring system, uh, we really need to think about where we think that drift is going to happen and if clinician trust is going to interfere with our ability to kind of observe that performance decay. Um, and there are various solutions that people have kind of suggested, ranging from, I guess, clinician education to be like, hey, maybe you shouldn't overly trust these models. It's always good to employ critical thinking um, because it is very tempting to trust these things especially now that we've seen chat GPT. Um, and there are other solutions people have suggested, which is to randomly assign patients to receive no machine learning algorithm, risk, uh, no machine learning kind of recommendation um, and just have that kind of as a control arm. Um, or you could think about kind of pulling in additional sources of data and extending these types of monitoring procedures. Quick question, Jean. Yeah. So, um is trust here the same thing as adherence? Like, yeah. So it's just, you know, uh, doing what the model says. And so what does over trust mean in that setting? Because you can't be over adherent to like medication. So how what, what does over adherent mean? Oh, um, I think if the, I guess I'm imagining like if the model isn't super sure, it's like it gives a risk prediction of 0 0.7. Um, but then the clinician just will treat like with 100%. Got, so you're assuming a thresh, treatment threshold of like 50% or is there a treatment threshold that you're assuming here for the model? Like the clinician is going to treat above a certain value and not? Yeah. So basically for the overtrust, it's basically a hard threshold as 0 0.5. Okay. Um, and then the other ones is basically there's some amount of randomization that the clinician does. Uh, you're you're using noise. So like, some yeah. amount of it is following the algorithm. Some amount of it is yeah, uh, random. Al although, if the algorithm is a good algorithm, then that ran that random actually is 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 potentially bad. Uh, yeah, and if the algorithm is a bad algorithm, the random might be good. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's exactly kind of the point. It's like whenever your algorithm is bad, but you're random, then we can like totally detect things. Got it. Thank but you. if the algorithm is good, uh, and if your algorithm is good and you follow it, that's fine. <laughs> but you need some amount of randomness for us to be able to detect anything. Okay, so we applied this to some real data. Um, this is still a retrospective study, though. Um, and we went back to the POMV example, grabbed data from UCSF MPOG, fit a random forest pr for predicting POMV. Um, started monitoring at the beginning of 2020, um, and you can see using either of these methods, the method uh, will fire an alarm around the end of 2020. Um, there's a slight, there's kind of an uptick starting in May 2020, 
um, so suggesting kind of the change probably happened around there, but there just wasn't enough data and enough observations for us to fire an alarm um, for like our specified like kind of type one error rate uh, until kind of the end of 2020. Uh, and then if you look at kind of the calibration curves, um, so this uh, is the x-axis is showing the predicted probability for the machine learning model, and then the y-axis is showing the observed event rate. So you want your you want kind of to be right on this diagonal line. Um, before May 2020, our machine learning model was pretty good. It was somewhat associated. associated. Um, Whereas kind of after May 2020, kind of the predicted probability is, has a very, very weak association with the actual event rate. So this makes sense why our algorithms would fire an alarm. Um, but uh, like it begs the question of like, why should we have just been updating our algorithm over time? Okay, what I realize there are 10 minutes left. Um, we're very far from the end of the slide deck, but I can actually just skip through kind of. And we have a proud tradition of making sure people don't make it through all their entire slide deck. So that's perfect. <laughs> okay. so I'm going to speed through this uh, QI part. Um, we're going to hold that thought about like would monitoring, uh, would model updating have helped our POMV model? Um, so here we design kind of a method for updating these machine learning models over time with hopefully stronger performance guarantees. Um, and for those of you who are less familiar with model recalibration methods, it's actually very simple, um, especially for methods using logistic regression. You just take a machine learning model that's miscalibrated. So this is your calibration curve. You want that on that ideal diagonal line. You feed that prediction into a logistic regression model, and hopefully you end up back on this kind of diagonal line. So there are methods that exist for doing one-time logistic recalibration. Um, and what we're really asking is like, can we do online recalibration? Can we have an evolving machine learning model? And can we recalibrate it? Uh, so we have a mach evolving machine learning model F hat of F hat sub T, and then we also have these uh, parameters in our logistic regression model that constantly recalibrate this model so that hopefully we're always on this diagonal line. Okay, so we've kind of, we worked on this method. There are existing methods that we adapted. Let's see, um, blah, blah, blah. Um, the whole idea is that there are game theoretic online learning methods. So if some from the, kind of CS literature that do give guarantees. And if we used a Bayesian method to learn the logistic recalibration parameters, we can actually establish performance guarantees of this flavor. Um, the idea here is, so L here again is our loss. Um, the loss of our online recalibration method that takes in kind of, uh, that tries to recalibrate an evolving machine learning model um, is compared against the loss of locking the original model. And we can basically provide um, bounds on this difference in the average performance. Um, and if you kind of use some nice bells and whistles, you can kind of, um, we can show that we can get pretty tight bounds that are actually applicable over more realistic time periods, whereas I think a lot of the existing literature, T has to be like 10,000 for something to actually be use, usable. Uh, and then you can also kind of think about different types of these performance guarantees. This one is just our regret in not locking the original model. So you would want your online recalibration method to do at least as well as the locking the original model. So you want this to be bounded. Um, but you can also think about other types of guarantees, like do we want the performance of our online recalibration method to do as well as kind of the best possible uh, updating method out there? Um, so this is, the blue is a bit more like power and the red is a bit more like, or this orange color is a bit more like uh, type one error. Anyhow, so we established, we kind of, created a method that provides these types of guarantees. 
Um, I, I'll just kind of run through this. But the basic idea is there are existing methods for continually retraining a black box machine learning algorithm. Like you could just take, I don't know, a gradient boosted tree and every time you get more data, you retrain the entire model. That doesn't have any performance guarantees. Like hopefully if things are stationary, then maybe your machine learning model will be fine, but there are really no guarantees that you can get out of this. What you can do is kind of apply the method we proposed um, that gives you all of those bounds on the performance differences um, and wrap that around any continually retrained black box machine learning model. And now you do get performance guarantees. Um, they're stronger in the sense that uh, we can get guarantees on performance in terms of the average loss, um, but it's still looking at some sort of average loss over some time period. And if we're really concerned about performance in very short time chunks, uh, then it doesn't give you very strong guarantees. So strong and weak as well. Um, and the idea is, what if we just go one step further and wrap and uh, performance wrap the evolving algorithm inside a performance monitoring method? So now kind of our, our model updating procedure has guarantees in terms of bounding the average loss, but our performance monitoring procedure has guarantees for detecting sudden performance decay. And together, hopefully we'll be able to establish kind of a more reliable and robust machine learning model that can be deployed over longer periods of time. Okay. so. Now we're coming back to the POEMV and uh, the confounding medical interventions example. And the question is like, can we take all of those tools um, that we have, the monitoring tools that we have developed for confounding medical interventions and apply it to an evolving machine learning model? Um, and because we already, all of the math that we had established, um, was really handling the case of like non-stationarity in the clinician. We're also able to address non-stationarity of our machine learning algorithm. And so most of the math is actually exactly the same, which is great. Um, there is one key difference, which is that these monitoring methods do assume conditional independence of current outcomes. Uh, like the current outcomes that you're observing have to be conditionally independent of past outcomes given covariates. Um, and that can be violated if you have an evolving machine learning model. And the reason is if I'm re continually retraining our model, we can take some past outcome, use that to update our risk predictions. But this ex the existence of this arrow will introduce a collider bias. So this type of conditional independence assumption will no longer hold. And so you can't actually have your machine learning model train on the same data that's used for monitoring. And so if you want to monitor a continually evolving machine learning model, um, I think the ideal way is really to split the data. Half of the data or some proportion of the data is dedicated to monitoring and some proportion is dedicated to training. So, uh, Gene, that's really interesting because, you know, in uh, some of the more recent random forest literature, they talk about honest trees where mm -hmm. partition during training, one yeah. is you learn the like splits, one to assign the actual leaves um, yeah. has this very similar flavor to it. Um, yes. I, I, just recognizing the time, I know Sardar has a question, so maybe we can get to his question and I think wrap up just because I know. Yeah. We're very close. So, so that you want to ask your question? Sure. So, uh, uh, sorry if you covered this and I missed it, but uh, I'm a little bit confused about the the online calibration piece. Yeah. What, is the is the risk that you're calibrating against? Is that the observed risk in the presence of an intervention or in the absence of an intervention? Yeah. So the the method that we had developed for model updating was really designed. It wasn't designed for settings with interventions. However. I think a lot of the conditions we established in the monitoring side, um, as long as you can establish very similar conditions, I think you can kind of apply the existing standard model updating methods to the CMI setting as well. 
I think you would basically I, I, have to go through similar formulations of ignorability conditions. Because hmm. like that, you know, the, the definition of risk completely changes in that uh, when yes. you have an intervention, right? So if you have a model that's, uh, you know, 100% accurate uh, with 100% uh, effective interventions, you basically are in an ideal world, you would, uh, your risk becomes zero. It's not really zero, the, the yes. way a clinician understands it, but mm -hmm. because of the model, it's zero. So it's, yeah, yeah. It's complicated. I, okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. I know you got more, but I think is a time where we may have yeah. to. Yeah, uh, I think that's basically it. Um, basically, what we did was we combined the monitoring with the a continually retrained random forest, and then we found that uh, our method was no longer fire and alarm, and we get calibration over time as well as kind of AUC improves. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much. This is the most detailed and I think like uh, grounded in theory. <laughs> um, presentation I've heard from anyone on this. So really congratulations on your prior grant. Congratulations on this ongoing work and uh, hoping to collaborate and learn more from you. Yeah. Thanks everyone for having me. Thank you.